If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. What's going on, everyone? I'm Sean Winslow, and this is the Multifamily Money Podcast. Welcome back to the last episode of 2021. This year has been a crazy year. Hopefully, 2022 will be better, better for everyone, better for everyone you know, your family, your friends, and obviously your financial success. So on today's Finance Friday episode, we're going to dive into financial goals. Obviously, it's about to be a new year, and this is when everyone gets on their goals and resolutions. And to me, obviously, I'm a little biased here, but I think your financial goals are probably your most important goals because once you are able to obtain financial freedom, there's so much stress that is lifted off your shoulders. And then you can focus on the things that truly matter, like your family, your friends, your mental happiness, your health, physical health as well, your mental health. With, without that stress of, you know, that financial stress of like, one, can I pay my bills? Two, can I afford to do this? Once that is all lifted off, everything becomes so much easier and you can focus on what really matters. So I think it's very important to have financial goals every single year. I do. And just like anything in life, you know, goals without a plan, without actionable steps are just dreams. And that's so true with, with finance goals too, because you can just throw out a number. Hey, I want to have $100,000 in cash slash in investable assets. Like, okay, that's, that's awesome. But how are you going to get there? And if you don't have a plan and a roadmap laid out, you're probably going to fail. You know? And then it's going to be this time next year and you're like, wow, I didn't achieve it. Well, of course you didn't. There wasn't steps put in place. So what I really want to, go over today is kind of what I believe everyone's financial goals should be. And this is not going to be number specific. That's different for every single person, but kind of the like categories and what you should set up in your life. And some of you might already have this, but I think it's also a a great refresher. And again, you got to track this stuff. Um, You got to, you got to track it. Otherwise you're not going to achieve it because at the end of the day, we, you know, with everything that's going on in our life, you know, if we don't track our financial goals, it's going to get lost in the shuffle and we're not going to achieve them. Um, also, I thought for the, you know, since we're talking about finance here, for those of you that are watching, I'm wearing my, my midtown uniform, as they call it, you know, dress shirt, dress slacks, and a, usually a Patagonia vest, but it can be any, any type of vest. So uh, Finance Fridays, this is Sean's uh, uniform. <laughs> but all right, let's let's get into it. So the first thing I think anyone should set up is a budget. Because if we this is the roadmap, and if we don't have a roadmap, like I just said, you're not going to get to your destination. It's going to be very hard to do that. So how I've done it, how I've set up a budget is first, just open up Excel and create your own personal income statement. So first line is going to be income. And that can include, obviously, if you have you know, a nine, to, a nine to five job, that's going to be your W-2 income or your 1099, however you get paid. Um, but then if you have any other you know, passive income, maybe you have a side hustle. So all your income, all the money that you bring in on a, month, on a weekly, monthly, or annual basis, all that is in the income line. And then next, this is really simple. It's Set all your expenses. So it's income minus expenses. So add up all of your expenses. And the easiest way to do that is if you've been using a piece of software called Mint, like I do. And that's just a web, web-based web service. It's free. You link it to all your accounts, to your bank accounts, to your credit cards, debit cards. Um, if you have you know, a house, a mortgage, investment accounts, all of that stuff. It links it. And then you could, that's the easiest way to see kind of track, like what, what is your monthly average of spending, or you can literally go through all your expenses, which I recommend, but obviously that is a tedious task, but that's how you can really, you know, hone in on what you're spending and where you can make adjustments. 
So you're going to go through all your expenses. Obviously, that's the big ones. Rent, or if you own mortgage, and then if you do own, then you're also going to have you know insurance and taxes on the property. And then I'd also include you know general maintenance and repairs. Generally, so for an investment property, I put away 10 percent for that and six percent for vacancy. But obviously, if you live somewhere, there's no vacancy, so maybe you know ten. 10 I would say. If, you know, about 5%. Um, obviously, if you rent, um, this doesn't matter, but 5 to 10% if you own the home. Because um, generally, I'd probably say more towards 5% because on investment property, you're renting 10% because these people don't live there. So they always don't take care of it like, it, like it's their own. And, and when you're living there, you know, you're going to do that. Um, so those are the main ones. And obviously, you have any other type of utility bill, you know, electric, heat, you know, maybe you have, you know, cable internet, that type of thing, your sub subscription services. And then, you know, you're going to get into more of your, your variable expenses, what, which might be, you know, groceries, your, um, if you go out, your entertainment, all that stuff. So you're going to want to see everything you sp spend on travel, all that stuff. And then, then that's going to give you your net, right? And hopefully, hopefully you're, you're positive at this point, because what you're going to do after that is you're going to want to then funnel the remaining amount into investments, right? Now, if you're not, if you're in negative in the, in the net, then you need to go back and obviously fix those things and re-budget. And so once I do that, I know where my budget currently is at. And then I'm going to see if it fits in to the budget that I should have, that you should have. And that's when you're first starting out, in my opinion, it should be a 50, 20, 30 budget. And what that means is 50% of your income should go toward, this is take-home income. So after taxes, Uncle Sam's got to get paid, right? Unless you invest in real estate and you're a real estate professional, but that's for a different, different topic. But anyways, 50% goes towards your needs. So everything you need to live. 20% towards your wants. Because at the end of the day, yeah, there are all those people that, will probably be significantly less than 20%, 5% or less because they're very frugal. But in my opinion, you need to reward yourself for your hard work. You know, we only, you know, are on this planet once we should enjoy it. And then 30% should go towards investments, retirement funds. And as you make more money, these numbers will shift. Um, and more will go towards that, the investments and less towards the needs and wants. So if you're making 50,000, I think the 50, 20, 30 is a great budget. But if you're making 100, 200, 300 or more, you don't need to live on 50% or you know between needs and wants at 70%. You don't need to do that. You should try to avoid, avoid that lifestyle creep as much as possible. And obviously, yeah, you still reward yourself every now and then, but as you shift, as you increase your income, you should shift more towards investments. Because then if you invest in the right stuff that produces an income, then that can, part of that income, that passive income then can pay for your needs and wants. And that should be your goal. You know, I, I've said this multiple times, live the life most won't now, so you can live a life in the future that most people can't. So suffer now so you can enjoy the future. And, you know, if you're, really into saving and investing, you could even go less than a 50, 20, 30 budget. You could have 50% towards investing. And I think that's where you should really aim to be that 40 to 50%. That's a great spot to be of your take-home income going into investments. You'll get to that financial freedom a lot faster. All right. So I, I ref, reference that I use Mint. It's, that, it's the web-based software that creates a budget and tracks your expenses. You, expenses, you simply go in and put budgets. So once you've you know, created that income statement and then compared it against a 50, 20, 30 budget and aligned where you need to be, then go into Mint and set those budgets. And then this will allow you to categorize your monthly spending so you can see where you're at. And this is something you're gonna wanna track because if you don't track it, then you're just gonna end the year in the same position you are now most likely, right? Yeah, we did all this work and we didn't track it. And of course, nothing happened. So this is something you want to track monthly. And I still look at it 
you know, weekly, not like an in, in-depth look, but I'll, you know, I'll see where I'm at and, and where I, I need to be, be heading towards, you know, for the rest of the month. But this should be something every month you, you look in depth at and see how you did, see what adjustments you need to make, if any, and, and see what you need to do the next month and, and so on. And this will really get you to where you need to be. And also be, be realistic, you know, take those baby steps. Like maybe you're nowhere near that 50, 20, 30 budget. Well, if you all of a sudden go to that 50, 20, 30 budget, just like anything in life, if you make a drastic change, you know, a lot of people will get burnt out of that and they won't stick to it because it's such a drastic change. So if you're in that circumstance where you're nowhere near that 50, 20, 30 budget and take baby steps until you reach that. Now, don't take too small of, of, of baby steps and you won't be able to reach your you know, annual goal but like reassess it every month, like month and, and bring it up to that 50, 20, 30 budget. And you, you'll be very happy with yourself as you, as you did it. And if you're really bad at, at allocating those um, funds, there, there are some um, pieces of web-based software that, I, that I'll talk about in a little bit. But the next category that you should be on your financial goals for 2022 is pay off high interest debt. You know, I've talked about this before. So anything they say above 5% is considered high interest debt. And the reason they say that is because if you have a low interest debt, you can generally, from an investment standpoint, you know, you can make anywhere from on average six to 8%, you know, that's generally what you'll make in the market. So that means you can make, make more in the market if it's below say 5% than the difference, right? you're paying off the 5% and then you make what's above. But anything above that 5%, you know, there are years where you're not going to hit that number. So they say any 5% is high interest debt. So you want to focus on paying that down. If you have a lot of high interest debt, I would even forego investing until that is paid off, especially if you're getting to the 15, 20, 25% interest rates, you know, you're going to see on credit cards. I would definitely focus on that first, pay that down. Cause that's, that's, that can just destroy, you, destroy your financial future. And I'm, I usually do not agree with Dave Ramsey, my, my good friend, Dave Ramsey, but this is where he gets it right. His, his snowball method of paying off the smallest account first, even if it's not the highest interest, pay that off first and then move to the next one that has the least amount and then the next one and the next one until it is all paid off. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, it's compounding interest. So you want to pay off a, a portion of it as quickly as possible completely. So that's not having compound interest. Um, so yeah, that's the best way. In my opinion, I agree with Dave on that, the snowball method. That's the best way to get out of that. So get out of that high interest debt, especially those credit card debt. It's going to destroy you. All right. And once that is paid off, then that's when you really want to focus on investing because we've talked about this in the, in the past, you know, compound interest in the good way, not, you know, credit card debt, compound interest that's positive for you. you know, it's the eighth wonder of the world, as Warren Buffett says. And we talked about this before, the earlier you start, the more you're going to have exponentially more in the future. So and invest early and often, and this should be in your budget. You know, obviously we talked about the 50, 20, 30, 30% 30 of your take on income should be allocated towards investments. And yeah, I'm a real estate guy, but I'm not one of those that's going to sit here and say everything in real estate. That's not for everybody. And also I think it's important to be diversified. You know, a big portion of mine is in real estate for sure. It's what I do. You know, I have more control over it. If them versus someone who'd passively invest in it, right? So that's just something I'm, in my opinion, really good at and something I really believe in. Um, but I also do have other investments and I think it's important. So real estate, obviously, number one, you know, that can be a, a plethora of things from, you know, directly investing and managing yourself or passively being you know, a limited partner in a syndication or, or, you know, a fundraise type of deal, or it could be in a REIT as well, which I don't recommend because it's, you're not really getting the full benefits of real estate and it's highly correlated to the stock market more than, you know, you know act direct in investing in real estate. So within, if once you invest in the market, if you have a job, obviously there's a 401k. I know a lot of people that do what I do say, 
who cares about the match? But I, to me, it's free money. So do at least the match. That's what I did. And then later you can roll it over into an IRA and invest directly in real estate. It's what I did. And then also invest in a Roth if you don't exceed the income limit. Because the Roth, you know, you put in after-tax money and then this, it grows and you can actually pull it out, um, even your principal tax-free without penalty over 59 and a half. So it's a very powerful. I love the Roth. And then also have a taxable account. I think that's really important. Because what I use my taxable account for is as I'm saving up to acquire property, this is what I've done in the past, is I've put my money in the market because just like we've talked about in the past, inflation destroys your purchasing power. Because as we have inflation, your dollar today is going to be worth less in the future. So if you just keep it in cash, that purchasing power is going to erode. So I put it in the market, usually something not very aggressive. Um, obviously, depending on your age, you're going to want to be even less aggressive um, if you're older. But I, I put it in something that's, you know, stock, like a, a stock fund ETF, something that's really, you know, has some growth, but it's not too aggressive and liquid, right? So then I can, you know, combat inflation, have it grow a little. And then when I'm ready to purchase a piece of real estate, I can pull that out. Yes, it's taxable, but I'd rather get a little tax than have my, my purchasing power erode. And then I think precious metals. Obviously, I don't have a lot of precious metals, but I think it's important. It's also hedge against inflation and diversification. All right. Next category that should be one of your financial goals is pay yourself first. Now, I've talked about this in the past. This is in many books, like The Richest Man in Babylon, where they say, you know, pay yourself first. And you can automate this process. Now, there's a company called Digit. I used to use, I don't use it anymore. But Digit, um, they, they link to your bank account and they have an algorithm that tracks your spending. And based on that, they do it you know, daily, multiple times throughout the week. And they see you know, where, where your spending habits have been. And then based off that, they, they calculate how much they can withdraw from your account and put it into savings. And they also state if they were ever to overdraft your account, they would pay for your overdraft fee. Um, if you're not good at saving, this is a great way. I did it back in my early twenties. I was able to save, you know, 15 grand in a short period, a very short period of time. And that jump started my, my investing. So I would recommend that to anyone. If, if you are good at saving, obviously I would automate this process. I think it's really best to automate this and set it up to those, you know, different categories, your investing category, maybe you're saving up for a house, a car, which I think you should invest those too, but have those separate, maybe your, your emergency fund, which I think is very important, which I'm about to get into. Um, and you can automate this through your bank account um, and they can pull it directly from when the, the income comes in. So automate this. And like I alluded to, now we're gonna talk about emergency fund. And this is very important. And I probably should have mentioned this even before I am now. I think after you create your budget, then you should focus on your emergency fund. And this depends on where you're at in life. So if you're single, no dependents, kind of first starting out, I would say you want three months of expenses saved. So this can get you through if anything happens. Obviously, you're young, so you're no, no dependents. Let's say some for some reason, you know, lose your job or something happens. You have three months to live on before you figure out your next move. And then once you have, some people say, if you're married, no dependents, you should be four to five months. Um, but I kind of lump these two together. If you're married and or have dependents, you should have six months of expenses saved. And then next is 12 months. And that's if you own a business or have unsteady income, like you are a salesperson, have a have commission. That's how you're paid, right? Um, I think you should have 12 months expenses saved because that's way more variable. And especially if you're a business owner, uh, I'm sure those that are listening no, like I have that sometimes you have to personally fund stuff for a time being. So I think it's important to have at least 12 months of expenses saved. So that's your emergency fund. That's very important. That's one of the first steps you should take after creating a budget. Um, that's another way just to relieve a little stress, you know, off, off the plate and do your best not to touch it unless it truly is an emergency. Um, and if you have a budget set up in place, then you shouldn't 
have to touch this unless there is that emergency. All right, next, we've talked about this in the past, and that's credit score. Achieve a credit score of 750 or better. And the reason for that is, like I'm sure most of you know, is everything becomes cheaper. Leasing a car, financing a car, getting a mortgage on a home, insurance on your home. If you have a better credit score, that, that means they know you're good at paying your bills, so it's going to be cheaper. Everything becomes cheaper when you have a better credit score. Even allows you to get in, you know, accepted at into an apartment. So if you if you're not familiar with how to do that, I had an episode on this. So check out episode 27. This is where I talk about you know what it takes to build good credit, what what the credit agencies are looking at, what categories. Um, so check that out. Now, last, the last thing that should be in your financial goals is investing in yourself. Now, is this really a financial goal? I think it is because if you invest in yourself, everything else is going to fall in place. So part of your budget in that, I think in the wants category, needs and wants category, probably more like a need, you should set some money aside for you know, investing in, in yourself. That could be you know, books, other learning materials, maybe some courses, your health, listen to podcasts, audio books. And then, like I said, your health, invest in a membership, maybe a trainer, um, better food. Because when you're in better shape, when you're in better health, better mental health, everything else will just fall in place and be easier for you. So those are my financial goals you should strive for. That's how I set up everything. And with financial goals, when you that allow you to achieve that financial freedom, like I alluded to earlier, it just relieves so much stress off your shoulders and allows you to focus on the things that truly matter to you. And that's what's important. You know, you get your time freedom back. You can spend more time with the people you love. You can give back to the charities that, that you, you, you want to. You can travel the world. Whatever it is that you know, is, means a lot to you, that is your burning desire, having financial freedom allows you to do that. But just like anything in life, a goal without a plan is just a dream. So you need to set up a plan, a roadmap to achieve these goals. And to me, this is the best way to do it. All right, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful new year. Best of luck to all of you. Get out there and crush these goals. All right, guys, I'll catch you on the next one.